information. He said the body of Grandmaster Hyman Dick was arranged for you. Throughout all of history, there have been many secret and occult methods, some lighthearted, some extremely dark, all in order to obtain the blessing of the gods or the world itself, or really any other type of ghouls. Today, we'll be exploring some of these methods by going through the ancient ritual iceberg. I do want to mention that this iceberg does mention festivals and other kinds of events. These also contain rituals inside of them and that's what these entries are referring to. For those entries specifically, I'll go over the festival briefly and then talk about the rituals that are contained inside of those festivals. It's a little bit confusing, but you'll see what I'm saying. I just wanted to preface this because I am definitely expecting a comment turning up on me about that. With that being said, I want to hit 10,000 by the end of March, so if you enjoy content such as this, Help me out with a subscription because it'd be a win-win for the both of us. Now, let's get into it. We enter the ancient ritual iceberg with tier one, Aztec human sacrifice. In Mesoamerica, human sacrifice was quite common amongst all tribes of people, such as the Mayans, Toltecs, and the subject of this entry, the Aztecs. It was a part of their everyday lives and likely existed since the time of the Olmecs, and they would perform these human sacrifices in order to honor their respective deities. They had believed that doing these sacrifices would allow the gods to get their energy back, or in other words, replenish them. The victims of these sacrifices were often prisoners of war, but surprisingly enough, they were fine with being the victims of these sacrifices. Because those who were used in these sacrifices believed in the same religion as the Aztecs, and in the religion that they followed. And in that religion, those who would sacrifice themselves in either combat or ceremonies would be guaranteed to reside in the highest level of paradise in the afterlife. Hence is why they were satisfied with such a fate. And not only this, they were treated with much respect from the Aztecs themselves while completing the ceremony. To get into the ritual itself, they would be taken to the top of a temple where the priest would quote unquote prepare them. The victim would then be laid on a stone slab by four priests, and the fifth would take a ceremonial knife made of flint and slice open the victim's abdomen. And then they would extract the heart and place it into a bowl held by a statue representing the god that they were honoring. They took the heart because they believed that it contained the individual's essence in a fragment of the sun's heat. They then disposed of the body by taking the viscera and feeding it to the animals within the zoo of the temple, and then taking the victim's head and displaying it on a skull rack. Pretty gruesome beginning guys, but I guess you can take solace in the fact that the victims do feel honor in partaking in this. Ancient Egyptian Mummification So this entry was a ritual that primarily focused on preserving the body for the respective afterlife that the Egyptians believed in. This would usually begin after post-mortem or in other words, the subject passed away. They first removed the organs of the subject starting with the brain and they actually extracted the brain through the nostrils using special tools. And then they removed all the other organs and preserved those in jars. After all that stuff was done, they cleaned out the body and filled it with natron, which is a type of salt. And after filling this body, they would then cover the entire body in the salt. And after doing all of this, they left the body out to dry for 40 days. And they did this because it removed moisture from the body and thus prevented it from decaying. Once these 40 days passed, they cleaned the body and rubbed it with oils to preserve the skin and stop it from cracking. The body would then be wrapped in those trademark bandages you always see the mummies in, while having protective amulets placed in between the layers of said bandages in order to give them magical protection in the afterlife. While doing that, priests would do spells and prayers just to buff up the mummies even more. And after the entire ritual has been completed, they would then place the mummy into a coffin and then place the coffin into a tomb along with all those treasures and goods you always see in all like the pyramid mummy movies and this was to provide even more protection in the afterlife as they believed that everything that was left with the mummies would be brought with them to the afterlife and yeah after this entry i realized why all the mummy movies are the way they are greek olympic games this one's pretty lighthearted. The Greek Olympic Games was an event that was held every four years in Olympia, Greece, similar to our own. These started in 776 BCE, and these served more as a festival to celebrate Zeus, the king of the gods, rather than being focused on the top athletes of the world like how we do it. And when the Greek Olympic Games were first created, there was only one event. This was called the Stadion, and this was a single foot race that was the length of the entire stadium. 
but as time went on they added more sports such as boxing wrestling pink tration all sorts of stuff only free born greek men could participate in these games and you had to take an oath to train at olympia for 10 months before the games and to play fair this wasn't the only part of the ritual though because the games would begin with sacrifices of animals or valuables no humans though and whoever won was awarded a wreath made of olive leaves and would be honored as a hero in their hometown with it being mandatory for a statue to be crafted of an olympic winner at their hometown which is dope these games were abolished in 393 ce by emperor theodosius due to the christianization of the roman empire but as we can see it returned in its own modern form later on nordic viking burials so these were rituals as his namesake suggests reflected the beliefs of the norse during their viking age they had all types of burial practices but I believe the reason they get a spot on the iceberg chart is because of the unique and iconic ship burial practice. This practice was primarily dedicated to either wealthy or high ranking people in the Viking society and they would be buried along with all their weapons, tools, sacrificed animals, all sorts of stuff would be brought with them to the afterlife and this was to reflect their status or personal preferences. They would then place the ship in a burial mound or on land or they would just light the boat on fire. They did all of these practices due to their belief of Valhalla and serving Odin when it came time for Ragnarok. Roman Gladiator Games So the Roman Gladiatorial Games were more of a form of entertainment rather than a ritual, but it still started as a ritual at first so it counts. These took place in ancient Rome from 3rd century BCE to 5th century CE. So the Roman Gladiator Games started as funeral rites in honor of people who had passed away, with the battle serving as tribute, but as mentioned earlier, it became entertainment later on. These battles would be held in large amphitheaters, for example, the famous Colosseum in Rome. The gladiators in the battles were usually slaves, prisoners of war, or criminals who were trained to fight in the arena for the sake of entertaining the public. They would have the participants attend specialized gladiator schools with their own different classes, types, weapons, and fighting styles. Not gonna lie, it sounds like a video game. Sometimes they'd have one-on-one -on -one battles, which they referred to as Munera, or large-scale battles that had tons of people fighting all at once. These were referred to as Ludi. All kinds of people from all over would come to watch these events, even slaves, and people indulged in these events similar to how we watch sports of today. Although it may seem like it, all fights were not lethal either. Another thing about this ritual is that a lot of rulers, kings, etc. would use these in order to assert their power, social status, things of that nature. To them, it's like how you were 10 using your Beyblades to battle and establish a blader hierarchy in your own middle school. These were obviously abolished with the rise of Christianity as it was just too brutal and violent for the religion and, you know, it took over at the time. Celtic Druid Rituals So these rituals were an important part of the religious and spiritual practices of the Celtic people and to set a little bit of foundation, the Celtic Druids revered nature big time and they believed that spirits were contained within natural elements such as trees, rivers, stones, basically everything created by the earth itself. And due to this, their rituals would only take place in natural settings. More specifically, the same place they chose to communicate with the spirits and seek their divine guidance on a natural day-to-day -day basis. They would also perform the rituals during cycles of nature, but primarily four days that celebrate the four equinoxes, one for each equinox. And there they'd have feasts, bonfires, sacrifices, etc. Fire to them held significance in all of their rituals because it resembled the presence of the divine and the Celtic believed in the power of sacrificial offerings. But compared to others, their offerings were quite tamed. It was just usually food, livestock, valuable objects in exchange for blessings and protection. Nothing more than that. Druids would also perform divination rituals. These included scrying, augury, and reading the movements of clouds and stars. And this would allow them to gain insight into the future after interpreting the results of these rituals. They performed such rituals for other occasions like births, marriages, death, seeking the guidance of their ancestors, and many more. And they passed these rituals down from generation to generation. In a way, it's like magic. Chinese Ancestor Worship As its name suggests, Chinese Ancestor Worship is the practice of paying homage and tribute to the past ancestors of yours. To get a feel of the potential origin of these types of rituals, is founded off of the Confucian virtue of filial piety, which revolves around respect, obedience, and care for your ancestors. And this virtue is one of many aspects of the Chinese culture. And then the Chinese also believe that the spirits of their ancestors continue to exist 
and influence the lives of their descendants. So ancestor worship seeks to maintain a connection with their ancestors and ask for said guidance. The way they continue to worship their ancestors even after they've passed is by maintaining altars and shrines and offering symbolic items to these shrines in exchange for their blessing. But not only that, to display their respect and gratitude. They would also perform acts of bowing and chanting prayers at certain events, such as the Lunar New Year and the Hungry Ghost Festival as a form of worship. I really like this entry because it emphasizes the importance of families and bonds within said family. I like things like that in general, but yeah. This entry is still a modern day ritual, but obviously it's here because it originates from ancient times. Biblical Animal Sacrifice this entry refers to the ritual practice of offering animals to God as a form of worship, obedience, or atonement as described in the Hebrew Bible. Correct me if I'm wrong, but this system was set up by God through Moses as a part of their covenant. When this would happen in the Bible, it was usually to symbolize the surrender of someone's possessions, desires, and sin to God. They would acknowledge their place when compared to him by doing a biblical animal sacrifice. And this is an event that comes up in the books of Leviticus and Numbers. And there'd be like instructions as to what type of animal should be sacrificed, the manner of it, and I guess the occasions too. Sometimes there were burnt offerings, sin offerings, guilt offerings, peace offerings, and more. And these individual types of sacrifice would have specific rituals, regulations, and symbolic significance behind them. If I had to interpret this, I think this was to emphasize the many aspects of the worshipper's relationship with God and how many parts of yourself that you had to have control over or maintain in order to keep a healthy relationship with God. So here, I'll go over one of the rituals, which is the burnt offering. The worshiper would bring an animal without any defects or damages to the altar of sacrifice and present it to the priest. And then the priest would then eliminate the animal and sprinkle its blood on the altar while burning certain portions of the animal as an offer to God. And these kinds of sacrifices weren't just external sacrifices, as in sacrificing the animal and then, oh, that's it, God's happy. Certain actions like shedding the blood was believed to symbolize the purification of sin and the healing of a relationship with God. And a lot more actions within the rituals more or less symbolize things like that. Now this is a bit of a sensitive topic, but there are those who interpret Jesus' death in this manner as well, as they view his sacrifice as one of these rituals, as it does fulfill the symbolic and spiritual purposes of animal sacrifice and overall represents the ultimate atonement for sin and reconciliation between God and humanity. Salt tea in India. Salt tea was a practice in India where widows would self immolate on their husband's funeral pyres. It originated in ancient Indian culture and mythology and is, it's seen as a demonstration of devotion and loyalty. It's widely practiced among the upper caste and it reinforces patriarchal norms and symbolizes women's subordinate status in those countries and religions. It's a very controversial topic and so controversial that I don't know why it's on this list. However, I'm gonna leave it there. Maya ball game. Maya ball game is more known as Ulama and it's an important part of ancient Mesoamerican culture. This was a ball game that was played on special ball courts that you can find in many old Mayan cities today. And the game had two teams competing to get a rubber ball through stone hoops that were like sideways basketball hoops only using their hips. Despite the recreational fun part of this game, there was, of course, heavy symbolic significance. This game was supposed to represent cosmic battles between gods, the cycle of death, fertility rituals, tons of just super mind blowing deep stuff. And this was all for the sake of their crops growing better. And if you thought it was serious, wait till you hear this. Winners of the game would be treated as if they were heroes. But God forbid you lost, you were likely to deal with social stigmas all the way to being a potential subject for a sacrificial ritual. Ancient Olympic Truce The Ancient Olympic Truce is another ritual that comes from ancient Greece and this connects to the other Olympic entry in a unique way and here's how. During the time of the Olympic Games there was a temporary halt of all hostilities, conflicts and wars between Greek cities and this was in order to make sure that everybody would be able to both participate in and watch the Olympic Games without being hurt or in fear of getting hurt from another country. This truce would begin right before each Olympic festival and would last for about three months and this would cover all the necessary time for people to travel in and out of Olympia and all the events without the chance of them getting hurt, being in fear like I said earlier. This truce had its religious significance as well as it was believed to be sanctioned by the gods themselves, specifically Zeus, because 
Zeus's sanctuary was the site of the Olympic Games. And with him being the big boy god and all, the Greeks believed that successfully hosting the events with everybody able to spectate and join would allow them to follow his will. As the unity and harmony that came from these actions reflected the Greek ideals, it would also serve as a platform for diplomacy and negotiation between different city-states since they weren't fighting anymore. I mean, even today, we kind of get that with our Olympics, but yeah, this really could have been under the first Olympic Games entry, depending on how the creator of the iceberg wrote it. With that being said, we close out tier two and go straight into tier one. I don't want to waste your guys' time. Samurai Seppuku. This is also known as Harakiri, and this was a ritual self-elimination method practiced by Japanese samurai as a form of an honorable death. It is quite popular nowadays, and I think it was even popular back then, as in a lot of people knew about it, so this should be in tier one, but whatever. It was usually performed with a short blade, followed by a horizontal cut across the abdomen, and the ritual was deeply ingrained in samurai culture and was considered an honorable way to atone for disgrace or failure. Samurai would also use this to avoid falling into enemy hands if they were cornered, and you know, just honorably going out. The act of seppuku was highly ritualized with specific procedures and etiquette to be followed and it often began with a ceremonial bath and dressing in white robes if it were being done formally. The individual would then compose a death poem or statement expressing their reasons for choosing this action and their final thoughts. A second or kaishakurin would usually stand by to finish the job very quickly by removing the head of the person who committed this act. I really have to phrase my words good here for YouTube. But yeah, this was to spare the individual from suffering even after committing this act of harakiri. And it was not only a means of preserving honor, but also a demonstration to one's cause. However, it can also be a form of punishment if, you know, you offended a lord or showed disloyalty or failure in battle. If you wanted to honorably go out, the lord would have you do this. This practice did decline with the abolishment of the samurai class in the late 19th century. However, people still know about it to this day. Vedic Fire Sacrifices Vedic Fire Sacrifices, also known as Yajanas, were rituals performed by ancient Indo-Aryan priests as prescribed in the Vedas, the oldest sacred texts of Hinduism. These rituals were central to Vedic religious practices and were believed to establish communication between humans and the gods. This was so they can obtain their blessings and divine favor. These fire rituals would often involve offering Various materials such as clarified butter, grains, and herbs in the sacred fires accompanied by the chanting of specific hymns and mantras. The performance of the Vedic fire sacrifices were highly structured and precise, with different types of yajas serving specific purposes and invoking different deities. Some sacrifices were conducted for general prosperity and well-being, while there were other sacrifices that were aimed at fertility, success in warfare, just tons of other things. They almost had a yajna for everything you need to do on a daily basis. The rituals were often elaborate and required priests, altars, and meticulous adherence to specific protocols of these rituals. While the practice of yajas evolved over time, they eventually declined with the event of other forms of Hindu worship. And even then, the underpinnings, I guess, of these rituals still stick around in today's teachings of Hinduism. Roman Lupercalia Festival. The Lupercalia Festival was an ancient Roman pagan celebration that was held on February 15th every year. It was dedicated to the god Lupercus, the god of shepherds and fertility, and the legendary she-wolf who nursed Romulus and Remus, the founders of Rome. The festival was characterized by purification rituals and fertility rituals, and this was supposed to symbolize like the transition from winter to spring around the time because it's February 15th. During Lupercalia, Priests known as Luperci would gather at the cave of Luperco on the Palatine Hill in Rome. They would sacrifice goats and a dog and then hide the strips from the sacrificed animals to create thongs or strips called februa. The Luperci would then run through the streets of Rome clad in loincloths made from the goat hides, lightly striking women and crops with the februa and it was believed that this act would promote fertility and bless them as in ensuring the health of pregnant women and warding off evil spirits and the potential for infertility. Despite its pagan-like origins, Lupercalia was tolerated by the early Christian church and elements of the festival were eventually incorporated into the Christian celebration of St. Valentine's Day, which falls the day before Lupercalia. 
Over time, Lupercalia did fade into obscurity, but you can still see some of its influence and everything it did in our modern day Valentine lovey-dovey traditions. Spartan Agolj. The Spartan Agolj was the education and training system implemented in ancient Sparta to mold young boys into elite warriors and citizens. The term Agolj translates quite literally to raising in Greek. And this is supposed to reflect the nature of the Spartans educational system, where it was just rigorous and rough. And boys were typically put in this system around the age of seven, and they underwent intense physical, mental, and moral training until they became big adults like Kratos. If you notice, that's probably why Kratos treats Atreus the way he does. The Agolj focused primarily on instilling military prowess, discipline, and obedience in the young Spartans, and their physical training included tons of endurance exercises, wrestling, running, combat skills, almost everything you can do, while the mental training emphasized obedience, self-reliance, and resilience. Boys were taught to endure pain, hunger, discomfort without complaint, fostering a sense of toughness and resilience that made a Spartan a Spartan, right? That's why these guys were so strong back in the day, because they was doing that since they were seven. In addition to their military-like training, they also wanted to cultivate a sense of loyalty to the Spartan state, and I guess an appreciation for the values of the society through doing all these things. But yeah, this played a huge role into making Spartans Spartans and creating these insane, resilient, monstrous warriors that we see in 300. And I know I didn't say this is outright a ritual anywhere in my description, but come on, this is a ritual to create a powerful man. Boy. Ancient Sumerian Marriage Rituals. These rituals were quite ingrained into the Mesopotamian civilization, and it usually began with proposal and negotiation, often orchestrated by families and intermediaries between the two families. And it really was just a typical marriage. However, they would do things such as pour oil and perfumes on the bride's head while there was all this stuff going on, like the feasting, the dancing, the music. This honestly seems like a normal marriage with a tiny bit of rituals. So there's not much to talk about here. However, if there's something I'm missing, feel free to tell me in the comments. Thesmophoria. Thesmophoria was an ancient Greek religious festival dedicated to the goddess Demeter and her daughter Persephone. And it was one of the most important religious events in ancient Athens and was exclusively for women. It had tons of elaborate rituals, including sacrifices, processions, and rites and women would gather at a designated site, often outside the city walls in order to participate in this event. They would also make sure that these rituals were hidden and shrouded in secrecy, and only initiated participants could attend. They made a big deal about keeping everything within secret. One of the themes of Desmophoria was the celebration of fertility, as the goddess Demeter is the goddess of fertility. Sorry for not mentioning that earlier. Women would perform rites to honor Demeter, and pray for a bountiful harvest for the season and the continued prosperity of their families, communities, and Athens as a whole. So that was the ritual part, but Thesmophoria also provided women with an outlet, as in um, an event to meet up with other women and just talk about their life, marriages, childbirth. It just, you know, it gave them an outlet around the time of Greece. Fog bodies. So this is a ceremonial practice related to the deposition of human remains in peat bogs, marshes, or wetlands. These rituals seem to be prevalent in ancient cultures, particularly the ones in Northern Europe, where the unique environment of bogs facilitated the preservation of human remains over thousands of years. While people don't really know what was going on at these rituals or have an exact example or answer, I'll just go over all the common themes and practices that have been observed through the study of these rituals. So first, there was the sacrificial offerings. Many bog bodies show evidence of violent trauma or deliberate elimination, suggesting that they were sacrificial offerings to supernatural forces or deities. And the act of sacrificing individuals in bogs may have been seen as a way to appease the gods and their cultures. Second, there's ritualized deaths. Some bog bodies exhibit signs of ritualized deaths in a way that they use specific methods of eliminating those in the bog bodies. I don't want to get into the descriptions because obviously that can get the video in trouble, but they handle sacrifices in a specific way for a reason. And third, there were placements of bog bodies in specific locations within the landscape, such as near water sources at natural boundaries, 
This suggests that the rituals were imbued with symbolic meanings related to the concepts of life, death, and the natural world since it was next to a river or other places like rivers. Vaults were often viewed as liminal spaces where the boundaries between the earthly realm and supernatural were believed to be thin. So this made them ideal sites for ritual activities. Overall, the bog body rituals provide insights into religious beliefs, social structures, and cultural practices of the Northeastern Europe societies that decided to practice this. Pharaoh's Hebsed Festival in Egypt. This was a ritual ceremony in ancient Egypt that was held about every 30 years or so to renew the king's strength and vitality. And this was rooted in the belief that the Pharaoh always needed to demonstrate his fitness to rule. So the festival would have rituals, processions, symbolic activities, and these were all to emphasize the Pharaoh's divine position as the representative of the gods on earth. These rituals would have gestures like running, dancing, military exercises. Meanwhile, he would offer many things and sacrifice many things to the gods in order to have their favor and support. One of the most important rituals of the Hebset festival, maybe the most important overall, was called the Jubilee race. And this was where the Pharaoh would demonstrate his ability to continue ruling by running a ceremonial race around a specially constructed track, often in the presence of the quote unquote gods that were present, priests, court members, and society as a whole. So yeah, this whole thing was just supposed to reaffirm the Pharaoh's competence as a leader and his strength, just so all the people knew that he was good to still rule. With that, we cover up tier two, and now we're gonna move on to tier three. Mithraic Mysteries. The Mithraic Mysteries are a series of rituals that were conducted within the cult's underground temples known as the Mithraea. And one of the rituals for these quote unquote Mithraic Mysteries was the initiation ceremony into the cult. They will participate in purification. This would involve the sprinkling of water or immersion in a sacred pool in order to, I guess, display cleansing and spiritual rebirth. Another ritual within the Mithraic Mysteries was the ritual meal known as the quote unquote sacred meal. And this ritual here was just eating a piece of bread and wine, which is supposed to represent the body and blood of Mithraeus. Another ritual within this initiation was the depiction of Mithraeus slaying the bull also known as the Tarochtony, and this sacrifice was often portrayed in relief sculptures within the Mithraea. It was supposed to represent the hero defeating the evil, the triumph of light over darkness, things of that nature, and the initiates who were trying to get into the cult would have to think about the deeper meanings of this ritual and reflect on Mithraeus' role as a savior and protector in order to get in. So I guess it was like a quiz in its own way. Overall, these rituals were more so to condition the people who wanted to join the cult into understanding and believing in the cult even more or just trying them out to see if they fit in Eleusinian mysteries so these were similar to the mithraic mysteries in the fact that they were a series of secretive rituals and ceremonies but these were held annually in the ancient greek city of eleusis and these rituals were dedicated to the worship of the goddesses demeter and persephone the Eleusinian mysteries were shrouded in secrecy, which is why they're called mysteries, and little is known about the precise nature due to the strict oath of silence sworn by initiates. However, people were able to piece together some details through ancient texts and evidence that's been found throughout history. So one of the rituals was the initiation ceremony. This was supposed to symbolize the journey of the soul through life, death, rebirth, etc. And people would have to undergo a ton of rites and rituals that included purifications, fasting, and doing symbolic gestures such as praying, dog Jesus, all in order to prepare themselves for spiritual transformation. And the climax of all of these rituals took place within the Telesterian, where the people would have to experience a profound revelation or vision that was believed to impart secret knowledge and enlightenment. But yeah, that's as much as I can find in terms of relevant reliable information this one's actually shrouded in mystery so i won't go into it too much more saturnalia saturnalia was an ancient roman festival that was dedicated to the god saturn this was celebrated every year in december and it was a time where people were just eating a lot having a good time all of that but the most important part of saturnalia was the role reversal ritual and this was where slaves would become masters and vice versa this inversion of social roles served as a gesture of equality and freedom during the festival. You were also able to gamble when that was prohibited during the times. 
Really, it was just a time for people to have tons of fun and celebrate the god Saturn. Saturn was the god of agriculture and, you know, he's basically to them responsible for feeding them, taking care of them throughout all of the harsh times of the year. So the Romans really appreciated him and decided to have the most fun they possibly can in honor of Saturn during these times by abolishing all the rules that don't harm people and just letting everybody cut loose. They would also participate in gift giving. This seems to be where Christmas came from in terms of its gift giving and that celebration. You know, I think it shares from Saturnalia. And yeah, it's just a twist on Christmas for the most part with a God at the center of it instead of family and gift giving and fun. Feast of the Tarasca. This celebration is also known as the Corpus Christi procession. And this is a huge traditional festival that's celebrated in the Spanish city of Granada. It takes place on the Thursday following Trinity Sunday. That's typically in late May or early June, depending on how the year goes. The festival originated in the 16th century and it just combines elements of Christian tradition with the local folklore from around that area. But the event also centers around a bunch of rituals. That's why it's even on this list in the first place that imbued the festival with the Tarasca. One of the rituals is the Tarasca being brought out. The Tarasca is depicted as a dragon-like creature with a female figure atop and is supposed to symbolize the victory of St. George over evil in the Bible. The procession typically begins with the religious elements such as prayers and blessings being said and brought around the area before the Tarasca itself is paraded through the streets of Granada. And once the Tarasca comes out and starts tweaking throughout the streets, the musicians will play tunes, dancers will dance around the Tarasca, and costumed characters start to interact with the crowd. It's like a big fun parade. And yeah, it's just a festival that's supposed to carry on tradition from back then where they would celebrate the Tarasca for blessings. But now people just do it more for fun and parades, you know, <laughs> not much else to say here. Cannibalistic rituals of the Caribs. Yup, this one's actually a dark one. I know you guys are here for the dark ones. The cannibalistic rituals of the Caribs were an aspect of their society, although they are sensationalized and misunderstood. These rituals were deeply rooted in religious beliefs, social norms, and survival strategies of the Caribbean. They would eat human flesh because they believed that it conferred spiritual power and strength upon people who participated in the ritual of consuming the flesh, contrary to popular misconceptions because you know it's cannibalism. And cannibalism among the Caribs was not just a random or arbitrary act of violence, but rather a carefully regulated practice with rituals and protocols behind it. Victims were often captured in warfare, conflicts, things of that nature, and they were ritually prepared before being consumed. They would do chants, dances, and offerings to the gods, and they did this because they wanted to sanctify the act of cannibalism and imbue it with religious significance. In some cases, the bones and the remains of the deceased were even preserved or used in ceremonial contexts. And that shows how much respect they did have for using, you know, cannibalistic practices. While cannibalism was a taboo practice in many cultures, for the Caribs, it just served as a means of asserting dominance over enemies and honoring the spirits of the deceased. I will say this though, it's important to note that Cannibalism was not a universal practice among all the Caribbean groups. So yeah, only some did this, but nonetheless, they're just like me. Zoroastrian Tower of Silence Rituals These rituals were integral to the traditional practice of disposing of the dead in Zoroastrianism, one of the world's oldest religions. These rituals are based on the belief in purity and the importance of maintaining balance between good and evil, and central to these rituals is the concept of ritual purity which dictates that contact with dead bodies contaminates the elements of earth, water, and fire. And as a result, Zoroastrians try to not bury or cremate the dead, but instead place them atop of a tower known as a dogma, or for the namesake, Tower of Silence. The process begins with the body being placed on the dogma, where the body will be exposed to both the elements and all kinds of birds. Usually the Zoroastrians are praying that it's vultures that come down because they want them to come down and eat the body. And thanks to the vultures' efforts over time, they become respected as agents of purification because they help to cleanse the body of its impurities by consuming the flesh. Once the body has been stripped of its flesh, the bones are left there to bleach in the sun before being gathered 
and placed in a pit that's within the tower. And this final stage of the ritual will ensure that all of the elements remain uncontaminated by the remains of the dead, which preserves the purity of the natural world, meanwhile getting rid of the body. But yeah, all these are just um, different methods to clean up a body after somebody's passed away. The Oracle of Delphi. This was an institution that was in ancient Greece and it was situated at the sanctuary of Apollo in Delphi. The rituals performed there were central to Greek religion and politics as the oracle was believed to communicate the will of the gods to mortals. The Pythia, who is the priestess, who served as the conduit between the mortals and the divine, was usually the one to perform these rituals and the rituals would begin with purification ceremonies where both the Pythia and those who wanted the answers from the gods would cleanse themselves in sacred springs or by performing evolutions. And this purification was to just make sure they were clean and ready to speak to the gods. You know, they held them in high regard. So obviously you had to be on your best look and behavior. And then Pythia would enter a trance to receive messages from Apollo, which is the god of prophecy. She usually had this trance induced by inhaling vapors rising from a chasm in the temple floor. But there were also other methods like fasting or meditation for these events. However, the vapors was usually the quickest and easiest route. After the Pythia basically got high, she would utter these cryptic prophecies and visions, which were interpreted by the group of priests and delivered to those who wanted the answers. The rituals surrounding the oracle were quite formalized and surrounded by tons of ceremonies and people just getting hyped. And offerings and sacrifices were made to Apollo and the other gods in order to invoke their favor and to make sure that the prophecies were not BS. The more you offered, the more likely that you were going to get a good and accurate prophecy. But yeah, that's the ritual for the Oracle of Delphi. And with that, we close out tier three. And now we're going to move on to tier four. Let's go. Skyclad rituals in Wicca. These are ceremonial practices where people will gather without clothing, often in a natural setting like a forest or on a mountain. And after that, they'll begin their rituals which just involves forms of prayer, meditation, chanting, spellcraft, any form of ritualized activities, you can name it, that was kind of the ritual of the skyclad. But the purpose of the skyclad rituals was the fact that they were naked. To them, that was the primary and most important ritual. This importance comes from the Wiccan belief that nudity fosters a sense of openness and freedom from societal constraints allowing the practitioners to connect more with the world and all that because when they are naked they want to feel the wind on their bodies the sun burning on them it's a naturalist connecting with the world kind of thing and they believe that by shedding their clothing they're stripping away barriers and layers of their ego and merging with the world more and more and i do want to try this not gonna lie celtic and bulk festival this festival is celebrated on february 1st or 2nd and the purpose of it is to honor the goddess Bridget. And this is the Celtic goddess of hearth, home, and fertility. So you guys can probably figure out by this point what it's for. And these rituals often involve creating a sacred space dedicated to Bridget, adorned with candles, flowers, and other symbols of the spring season. Offerings such as food, drinks, and crafts are also presented to honor her and seek her blessings for the coming year. And that's all basic rituals, right? but she has her own specific special rituals. And if you remember the other Celtic entry from earlier, you know that they like their fires and stuff. So one of the rituals for Imbolc is the lighting of fires. And this is supposed to symbolize the return of warmth and light as the winter begins to wane. These fires are often kindled from the embers of the hearth and used to light torches or bonfires that burn throughout the night. Participants may also engage in candlelit processions or rituals designed to invoke the protective and nurturing energy of the goddess Bridget. This is also a time for purification and renewal, both of the land and the spirit. So at these festivals, there's also ritual baths, cleansing ceremonies, people burning herbs all over the place. It's just a reset since spring's coming and winter's ending, and winter is the hardest part of the year. Ancient Hawaiian Makahiki Festival. This festival was a big cultural and religious event observed across the Hawaiian islands, and it would last several months because it was dedicated to the god Lono. This festival marked the beginning of the Hawaiian New Year, and it would coincide with the end of the rainy season and the arrival of the Makali'i, 
or in other words, the Pleiades constellation in the night sky. So the rituals that would take place during these festivals was the Ho'okupu or offering. And that's just um, typical, you know, giving things to the God in order to get their blessing. And they would bring it to temples and do prayers and chants alongside bringing these things to the gods. The Makahiki Festival also had things such as athletic contests known as the Makahiki Games. These were just competitions in wrestling, spear throwing, canoe racing, and surfing. It was basically the Olympics Hawaii edition. And these games were not only a test of physical prowess, but also served as a form of tribute to Lono and a means of fostering unity and bonds amongst the Hawaiian people. Dionysian Mysteries. These are another set of mysteries and it was just a ton of rituals and initiations dedicated to the god Dionysus. And Dionysus was the god of wine, fertility, and ecstasy. So naturally there would be wine in these rituals and they wouldn't have a lot of dancing, music, theater, things like that while being intoxicated in order to just commune with the god Dionysus and experience their quote unquote transcendence. So they did things of that nature, but they're called mysteries because obviously they're mysteries, right? We don't know exactly what they did, but these were the kind of things that they did. And I want to take my shot as to why I believed that they were having fun and dancing and getting intoxicated as an offering to Dionysus because Dionysus is the god of wine, fertility, ecstasy, and madness, right? So in a way, it's similar to burning a piece of paper in order to appease a god of fire. So that's probably why they took those actions as a ritual for Dionysus. However, we're still not exactly sure because, you know, they're called the Dionysian Mysteries and they were in hidden areas, secret societies, things of that nature. You can only take so many guesses based off of archaeological evidence. Not to Playa Megaliths. So these are a collection of ancient stone structures that are located in the Nubian desert of South Egypt. And these megaliths are believed to have served as astronomical sites for just the earlier communities of this region. And as for the rituals associated with this place, we don't have the exact details, but they likely played a role in the spiritual practices of the ancient communities around the time that they were being used. All we can say is that the archaeological evidence that's inside of the megaliths suggests that these structures were used for ceremonial purposes, likely rituals relating to astronomy, fertility, or just something else entirely. It's most likely astronomy though because the alignment of some of the megaliths line up with astronomical events like the summer solstice and the rising of specific stars. These indicate that these sites were used to observe and track movements or it could just be an insane coincidence. But come on guys, let's not do that. The odds are just way too unlikely. The structures being placed the way they are is more than likely a part of the rituals that they conducted here. So this could imply that these rituals may have been aimed at honoring celestial deities or marking important moments in the agricultural calendar, such as the planting and harvesting seasons. There's also the presence of pottery fragments and animal remains. This suggests that feasting and other activities of that nature may have taken place at these sites, but rituals conducted at Nob de Playa may have included offerings to ancestors or deities, prayers for fertility, dances, performances, all the above, but we just don't know. This is one of those open-ended entries and that's why it's so fascinating. Dogon Sigui Ceremony So this is a ritual that's celebrated by the Dogon people of Mali, West Africa once every 60 years. So this ceremony holds cultural and spiritual significance for the Dogon community and just involves tons of different rituals aimed at renewing the ancestral connections of the tribe and everything that, you know, their past family members have left for them. And there are rituals that honor their ancestors and these mythical beings called Namo. And they're believed to have played a crucial role in the creation and the development of the universe according to the dogon lore they'll do performances dances symbolic reenactments of these namo beings just for the sake of getting their blessings for the future of their communities another thing they'll do in the ceremony is create this sacred house known as the granary of the world and it's supposed to be a representation of the universe itself these are crafted and decorated with carvings and symbolic things you know like ice age type of stuff and I believe that these are to reference the Dogon's beliefs and their connection to the Nammo. They'll also do the typical, you know, cleansing and purification of the communities with the water, holy water type of rituals. But yeah, that's about it when it comes to Dogon Sigui ceremony. Siberian shamanistic practices. 
So these rituals encompass a wide range of methods with the intention for the person to connect with the spirit world and do a couple of other supernatural things. Since this isn't necessarily one ritual, I'll go over a couple of their rituals, their purpose, and the things that the Siberian shamans tend to do for most of said rituals. So the main thing is the shamanic journey, and this is where the shaman enters an altered state of consciousness in order to communicate with the spirits around them and seek their guidance. In order to do this, they'll have to do like rhythmic drumming, chants, dances, and this induces an ecstatic trippy state. And I guess in their beliefs, it facilitates spiritual contact. And then they'll have like sacred objects and ritual tools that quote unquote have spiritual power. And this is supposed to help them in their practices, including, you know, drums, like I mentioned earlier, rattles, costumes, items that represent the spirits they seek to communicate with, things of that nature. There's also healing rituals that involve the extraction of spirits that may not be on your side from your body, as well as the use of herbal remedies, traditional healing methods, all the old stuff, you know, like the tiger bomb from Karate Kid. But yeah, that about sums up the Siberian shamanistic rituals. It's just what they would do to invoke spirits and communicate with them and things of that nature. Orphic mysteries. I'm going to be honest, guys, I don't like these mystery entries because they're just open ended but in the wrong way, right? We're just supposed to guess everything about it. And I'll go over what information I was able to get about the Orphic Mysteries. So these were rituals that were associated with Orpheus, who was a legendary poet and musician. And the rituals contained in this entry are supposed to symbolize Orpheus and his story, things of that nature. So first, purification played a role in these rituals, and this was to symbolize the cleansing of the soul from impurities, preparing initiates for spiritual enlightenment, just like all the Greek gods and goddesses with their rituals, you've got to be clean. And then people who wanted to be initiated would have to undergo various purification practices, such as bathing, fasting, abstaining from certain foods and behaviors. And these acts of purification were believed to purify the body, mind and spirit. Once they did that, they will undergo the ceremonies. These took place in spaces such as temples or groves. And they would do prayers and recite sacred texts and hymns and basically impart esoteric knowledge to the initiate. And then the biggest part of the Orphic rituals, like the standout part, is that they had the pursuit of mystical union with the divine. And they would go through meditation, contemplation, and ritual practices in order to just transcend the limitations of the material world and become this, you know, very enlightened being. It's kind of representing Orpheus because again he was a poet and musician which is the peak of creativity and through these rituals you are working towards I guess working on your mindset your creativity your philosophy things of that nature however there are still a lot of unknowns about what happened in these initiations back in the Greek times but I guess this is what researchers and people were able to find through previous records Australian Aboriginal Initiation Rites. So this one is a tiny bit dark, but Aboriginal Initiation Rites are sacred ceremonies that mark the transition of young boys into manhood within the indigenous Australian communities. And these rites vary among different Aboriginal groups, but they do share common themes of spiritual significance in the passing down of traditional knowledge. I'll go over the must be done parts of the ritual, and I'm not gonna get into the small differences between each tribe because that might as well be a video in itself. So I'll give you guys a more general outlook on this entry. The initiation rituals typically commence with a period of ceremonial preparation. And during this phase, the initiates will undergo spiritual and physical preparation under the guidance of their elders and leaders. This can involve seclusion from the community, fasting, receiving instruction on cultural customs and spiritual beliefs. Then they'll do the ceremonial scarring or body modification. And through these, they'll put intricate patterns or designs onto their skin and they hold cultural significance and symbolize their identity, belonging, and cultural heritage within the whole Aboriginal community. It's basically a mark. And there's also purification rituals, and these are to cleanse the initiates before they begin their journey into manhood. So they'll do ceremonial bathing or smoking ceremonies, and this is supposed to purify them. They're also immersed and taught about the mythology of the dream time. And this is the Aboriginal concept of the spiritual realm. Through storytelling, dances, music, every artistic expression, they'll learn more about their ancestors, creation stories, and the connectedness of all beings through the spirit realm. 
These rituals are basically a lesson about their history. And now we have the challenges. These are designed to test the person's physical, emotional, and spiritual resilience. These challenges can include tests of endurance, facing mythical creatures in the dream time. I'm not sure how they do this, but maybe, you know, ask them yourselves. Or they'll endure symbolic pain as a rite of passage. Overcoming these challenges is supposed to just let everybody know they're a man and they're ready to assume the adult roles. But yeah, that's all it is. It's like a rite of passage for a boy to become a man. Pacific Islander Kava Ceremony. In the Pacific Islands, this is a traditional ritual that holds a lot of cultural and social importance. Usually it'll begin with the preparation of kava. This is a drink made from the roots of the kava plant. The roots are pounded into a powder and then it's mixed with water in this large wooden bowl known as a tanoa. And the person responsible for preparing this is often referred to as the tavalea or taki, depending on the island culture. And he follows these methods and rituals while preparing the drink. Usually, these are invocations and prayers to seek blessings from their ancestral spirits or deities. And the ceremony is conducted with strict adherence to traditional protocols and etiquette, guided by the authority of the village chief or appointed ceremonial leader. Everybody present is also expected to have like respectful behavior. You know, it's only right. It's a big, serious moment for whoever is involved. So once the kava is prepared, it's presented to those who are participating and the server carries the tanoa containing the kava and will approach each participant in turn and they'll each receive a coconut shell or cup filled with the kava drink. The serving order may be determined by factors such as age, social status, or specific roles within the community. Now we get into the drinking part because even that gets serious. Participants drink the kava in a specific manner following the traditional customs and rituals and it is customary to clap once before receiving the kava cup and then clap again after drinking it as a sign of gratitude. The drinking of kava will usually be accompanied by communal chanting, singing, or storytelling. Whatever the people watching feel like doing in order to help the participant get in their zone. Once they finish the drink, the kava ceremony concludes with expressions of gratitude and farewell from everybody that participated. And the leader may offer his remarks, blessings, etc. just to signify the end of the ritual. Participants will just leave with a better sense of connection to their heritage and a renewed appreciation for the traditions that bind their communities together and what they've been growing up with. It's like a rite of passage you take alongside others, basically. With that, we finally conclude tier four. Now we're going to hop into tier five. Basque Witches Sabbath. In Basque folklore, the Witches Sabbath, also known as Akalair, are legendary gatherings where witches and other supernatural beings will gather for rituals and ceremonies and just to turn up in the middle of the night. So we'll get into these rituals. According to the lore specifically, witches from across the Basque region will gather at remote and secluded locations, often in the depths of forests, isolated hills, anywhere where they really can't be seen. And this is where they conduct their Sabbaths. These usually happen on special holidays. At the witches' Sabbaths, everybody who was there were said to invoke supernatural entities, including spirits, demons, deities, all that type of stuff. And they did this in order to, you know, exchange things with the demons and get something to help them. So they'd offer food, drinks, symbolic items, and they'll get the help of these monsters to do their bidding. And they'd often do like that typical secret society, walk around the fire, ask dance, you know what I'm talking about, to create these trance-like states and just enhance the ability of their witch spellcrafting, everything they want to do when they get back home. However, I don't think I was able to find any specific rituals here, but it's more so an event that contains supernatural entities that will do a ton of different rituals in order to just enhance their spell casting, demonology, all that stuff. Tibetan Sky Burials. So this is the exact same thing as the Zoroastrian Tower of Silence where they would take a dead person's body and allow it to be consumed by vultures on top of the stone slab. It's just a different group of people and it's under Buddhist beliefs here. However, it's the same exact ritual practice. So I don't think I need to go into this too much. Incan Kapakyuka. This is a practice in the Inca Empire where children who are often selected from noble families were sacrificed in order to honor the gods and ensure the empire's good future, prosperity, just bless them basically. The children were carefully chosen based on physical perfection and purity, and they were treated with the utmost reverence like kings leading up to the ritual. And this took place during times of crisis or significant events, such as the death of a ruler or an impending war as a way to appease their gods and hopefully get their blessings. 
During the ceremony, the chosen children were adorned and offered sacred food, drinks, eating the best they possibly can, and then they were led to a site often at high altitudes of sacred mountains, and then they would be sacrificed by the priests. The method of sacrifice varied, but let's just say they all weren't good and merciless. The belief was that by offering the lives of these pure and innocent children, they would get blessed by the gods. And this was deeply ingrained into their religious beliefs and played a good role in maintaining the social order and harmony within the empire. And while viewed as like this strong and solemn duty, it also instilled fear and awe among the populace because you know, the gods are just taking children from them. However, I don't know why the normal people would be worried about this, but you know how things were back in those days, right? Everybody was scared of everything because they didn't know that much. Like with most rituals on this list though, this was eventually suppressed as time went on. And this one specifically was because of the Spanish conquistadors in the 16th century. African Dogon Twin Rituals Back to our old friends the Dogon in this time when they would have twins born, they considered them sacred and even divine gifts from the creator deity Ama. And the birth of twins is celebrated as a blessing, but it also initiates tons of rituals. So yeah, one of the rituals in Dogon twin traditions is the naming ceremony. And this is where each twin was given a special name that reflects their unique identity and spiritual connections. And these names often carried symbolic meanings that would be related to like nature, ancestry, spiritual guardianship, whatever just sounded cool and strong. The naming ceremony is attended by all family members, elders of the village, and all villagers too. They would all offer their prayers and blessings for the twins' health and prosperity, so it can be eventually redirected to the community. Another ritual was the initiation of the twins into adulthood, and this would occur during their adolescence. The ceremony would mark the transition from childhood to adulthood and have tons of rites of passages, which would be like instruction and in knowledge and skills and the cultural customs of being an adult within the Dogon tribe. And basically they were just prepared to eventually lead the tribe because again they were twins they were special they were considered blessings and with great power comes great responsibility so naturally they had to be prepared to take on the world and become leaders for their tribes papua new guinean fire dance this is a ritual performed by various indigenous tribes across the country and it typically involves dancers in elaborate costumes and headdresses these headdresses will have like feathers leaves things of that nature on it to represent nature and then they'll get around a large bonfire and they'll dance sing chant play instruments around it just adding to the performance one of the coolest parts of this fire dance in my opinion is the dancers interaction with the fire itself they'll walk across hot coals barefoot or even hold embers in their hands or mouths just unaffected by the heat i always think stuff like that is cool especially because i saw it in a tv show before and I almost forgot why this ritual is performed in the first place. And it's just to celebrate births or the passing of family members or even like initiate boys into men. It's just, I guess, for the cycle of life and people's growth and passing away, things of that nature. Chaco Canyon Rituals. Chaco Canyon is a place located in present day New Mexico and it's known for ceremonial practices like rituals. And these used to play a crucial role in the lives of the people who live there and was quite normal. One of the rituals in Chaco Canyon was the observation of solstices and equinoxes. And these were marked by the alignment of certain structures within the area such as Pueblo Bonito and Casa Rico Nada with the sun's movements. These alignments would serve as focal points for ceremonies and gatherings and the community would just come together to honor the changing seasons and the cycles of the equinoxes all the while having prayer sessions, dancing, music, offering to the gods. And another part of these rituals was the use of underground ceremonial chambers known as kivas. And these were used for other ceremonies that included initiations, healing rituals, things of that nature. And they were often decorated with really nice art and carvings, all for the sake of prayer and communicating with those who have passed their ancestors. They're definitely something you want to look at. And honestly, if you're able to visit one, go check them out. Sogdian Funeral Rites. These were rituals that reflected the beliefs and customs of the Sogdian people back in their times. And these were deeply rooted in their religious beliefs, cultural practices, everything like I said before, it really reflected their culture. So they would begin with preparation of the body for burial. The deceased would be carefully washed, 
anointed with oils and perfumes, and dressed in their finest and most important clothes. And then they would also put personal belongings and important things to the person next to their body. It's supposed to symbolize the person's journey to the next world, just like how the Viking boat burials did where they believed that they would take everything to Valhalla with them. Just like that. And then the funeral processions in the Sogdian society were solemn affairs as family members and community members would all come together, just a basic funeral. But after, they would go ahead and start making offerings to their respective deities to ensure the person who passed away has a safe passage to the afterlife. They would do offerings, incantations, all things like that. And then they would have a feast after the funeral in typical funeral fashion. But I guess the way they saw the feast was another offering to the gods rather than just people having fun and eating because let's be real that's what really happens after a funeral we're not sad anymore we just hungry zuni shalako ceremony this is a ceremony that's celebrated by the zuni people this is a native american tribe in new mexico and the ceremony usually takes place in late autumn to early winter and it's a big deal for them so to start the ceremony we have the shalako dancers who represent ancestral spirits and deities and these dancers wear costumes and masks, all in order to embody different mythological characters and spiritual beings. So once the Shalako dancers arrive, they move through the village in a procession accompanied by chanting, drumming, and singing. And the purpose of this ceremony is to invoke blessings and ensure the well-being of the community for the coming year. Through these dances and prayers, the Zuni honor their ancestors, appease the spirits around them, and just maintain the harmony with the natural world. Not only that, but there's a good amount of symbolic rituals being performed as well, such as them reenacting the mythical stories that surround their lore and their history, purification ceremonies, and feasting. And sometimes they'll even offer cornmeal and prayer sticks to the spirit in order to just give gratitude for their guidance. Kind of like a lot of other entries earlier, it's just praising their respective deities and asking for more blessings for the coming year. Bhutanese Black Necked Crane Festival. So the Black Neck Crane Festival is held every November in Bhutan and is supposed to celebrate the arrival of the endangered Black Neck Cranes to their winter roosting grounds in the valley and it serves as a tribute to these revered birds which are considered sacred in the Bhutanese culture. The rituals performed during this festival are deeply rooted in the Bhutanese spiritual beliefs and cultural traditions. For example, we have the Cham Dances. These are mass performances that are conducted by monks in local villagers and these dances are imbued with all of their symbolism for their respective religion and they're believed to protect the village from evil forces each charm dance represents a specific aspect of Bhutanese folklore and through their movements and gestures they convey messages of respect for the environment gratitude for the natural world and reverence for these cranes in addition to the charm dances there's other rituals such as prayers and offerings to the cranes or traditional mantras, um, purification ceremonies, typical stuff, yeah. Ainu Bear Worship The Ainu people who are indigenous to the northern regions of Japan have a long-standing tradition of bear worship that's deeply rooted in their cultural and spiritual beliefs. This is called the Kamui Nomi, and this is a ceremony that reflects the Ainu's people's deep reverence for the bear. The ceremony typically takes place in a location within the forest where the presence of the bear gods is believed to be particularly strong. Before the ceremony begins, preparations are made to ensure its effectiveness. Offerings of food, sake, and other items of significance are carefully arranged on altars. Participants then don the traditional Ainu attire. This is like ceremonial garments for the occasion, and the ceremony itself is then led by a spiritual leader who acts as an intermediary between the human participants and the bear gods. After all this is set up, Chants, prayers, and vocations are all recited in order to invoke the presence of the bear deities and seek their blessings for a successful hunt. Participants can also get into dances and movements in order to enhance their ritual succession, but they don't really have to. Throughout the ceremony, there are offerings presented to the bear deities as tokens of appreciation and supplication. And these offerings can include freshly caught fish, wild plants, specially prepared dishes that are believed to be pleasing to the gods, the Ainu people believe that honoring the bear gods in this way will allow them to receive their protection during the hunting season. I'm like not trying to laugh because of the fish. I don't know why I find that so stupid. I think it's just because bears always eat fish in TV shows and stuff. So whatever. Anyways, we finish up tier five and now get into the final tier, tier six. 
starting with the Venda Python Dance. This is a ritual that's practiced by the Venda people of South Africa, and it's a ceremony that's supposed to honor the Python itself. Pythons are supposed to be symbols of protection within their culture, which is why they do these dances. So now we come to the dance, and this is when the tribe comes together to pay respect to the Python deity, Zugudini. And the ceremony typically takes place in a sacred grove. And they choose these locations because this is where Pythons reside. This is where they live. So it's only right to them. Before the ritual begins, preparations are made to sanctify the space and ensure its purity and safety. So the Python dance obviously has dance, music, ritualistic movements such as prayers, um, dogizas, bowing, and the participants are usually adorned in their traditional attire and they mimic the movements of the Python by kind of like holding each other together. You'll see in the picture here and they walk in a circle and move like a huge Python. Throughout the ceremony, they also offer food, drinks, herbs, symbolic items that are presented to the Python deity. And these are acts of devotion. Prayers and invocations are then recited to seek the Python's blessings for the community. This one kind of stands out to me because they offer for the sake of offering in their respect, but they don't expect anything back when they offer. They just pray and hope they get something back after doing the offering. Yano Mami Endocannibalism. So this is a practice where deceased individuals are consumed by members of their own community, which is the Yanomami people. And the ritual is rooted in the belief that consuming the flesh of the deceased allows their spirit to live on within the bodies of the living, ensuring their continued presence and protection throughout all of time. It reminds me of Hui Shang from Kengen, Ashura, and Omega. If you guys have read that, let me know if you have. This practice begins with the preparation of the body, which is carefully cleaned and then smoked to preserve it. The body is then cut up into pieces with parts distributed among family members and close relatives. And these parts are often cooked or roasted before consumption again, just to make sure you guys are aware of that. And the ritual of eating the flesh is then accompanied by prayers, chants, and ceremonies to honor the deceased. Endocannibalism serves multiple purposes in their culture, and it's just seen as a way to maintain connections with those who have passed away. Oral Festival of the Yoruba the Oral Festival is a religious ceremony that's celebrated by the Yoruba people of Nigeria, and it's dedicated to the worship of Oro. This is a deity who's associated with fertility, protection, and ancestral spirits. This festival is just considered to be sacred and is typically restricted to initiated male members of specific oral societies within the community. During this festival, there are rituals and ceremonies performed to honor the deity that is Oro and seek his blessings for the community. And the rituals often involve the use of symbolic objects, which can be masks, costumes, sacred implements associated with Oro, things of that nature. And participants may wear intricately carved wooden masks, which represent ancestral spirits or other mythological figures. And they can also engage in traditional dances or processions. Another aspect of this festival is invocation of the deity and ancestral spirits through prayer, chants, and offerings. Sacrifices of animals such as chickens, goats, and even larger animals like cows may be made to appease Oro and just allow Oro to protect the Nigerian people from misfortune. These sacrifices are usually performed by priests or elders who have undergone specific training and initiation rituals for this festival. This festival overall is just very strict and taboo and has a lot of rules. They just want to make sure it goes perfectly fine so nothing bad happens to their communities. Pueblo Corn Dance. The corn dance is a ritual that's entwined with the agriculture and spirituality of Native American tribes. At its core, the ritual just revolves around planting and blessing corn seeds. And the dancers will wear attire fitting for the situation and wear masks too. And they'll start dancing with music in the background. And they're supposed to do this dance that represents the nature of life, humanity, and things of that nature all things that are resembling the growth of plants so it you know the energy transfer to the corn and after that they'll plant the corn seeds into the soil and this gesture is also accompanied by prayers and chants all in all it's just to make sure that this corn is able to grow and have a successful harvest sammy noidi drumming so this is a drumming ritual that's supposed to be aimed at facilitating a connection with spirits and it often incorporates tons of chanting dancing, instrument playing, everything we've seen before. 
and the Noa'i typically begins this ritual by invoking the spirits and setting the intentions for the journey ahead. This can involve offerings of traditional foods, herbs, sacred items, things of that nature, all in order to honor the spirits in exchange for something they probably need in the future just to pop up. As the drumming continues, the Noa'i will enter a trippy state guided by the steady beat of the drum, and when they're in this state of consciousness, they're believed to transcend the physical world and begin to directly communicate with spiritual forces. And during these rituals, the people who are watching can also join in in the chanting and dancing just to add their energy to the experience and increase the chances of them getting a blessing. All in all, it's just a ritual to prepare the group or tribe for their journey ahead and hopefully they get some sort of protection out of it. Melanesian Cargo Cults These cults emerged in South Pacific Islands during the colonial era and these cults were characterized by the belief that ancestral spirits would deliver material wealth or quote unquote cargo to the indigenous people. These rituals often revolved around mimicking the behaviors of the colonizers, such as building mock airstrips, control towers, and other infrastructure in the hopes of attracting airplanes carrying goods. Followers would then perform elaborate ceremonies, dances, and chants in order to summon the desired cargo from the god. A big part of these rituals was the concept of mimesis or imitation where adherents would replicate the actions they believed led to the arrival of the cargo. This included donning uniforms, waving flags, and engaging in activities reminiscent of Western practices. Feast of St. Lucy in Scandinavia The Feast of St. Lucy is celebrated in Scandinavia, usually in Sweden, Norway, Denmark, or Finland. And this is a tradition that just lets everybody know that it's time for the Christmas season. And the focus of the celebration is the figure of St. Lucy, a Christian martyr known for her kindness and devotion. One of the rituals here is the procession of young girls dressed in white robes. This is supposed to symbolize purity. And then there will be a crown of candles adorning the head of the chosen Lucia or Lucy. This event takes place early in the morning with the Lucia leading a group of maidens, singing hymns and carrying trays of saffron buns and hot drinks to share with everybody who's present. The lighting of candles also plays a role as a quote unquote ritual in the festivities, since it represents the return of light during the darkest times of the year. Families will often gather together to enjoy all of this fun stuff going on, and it's basically Christmas if Christmas had a pregame. Huli Wigman Initiation in Papua New Guinea This is a ritual among the Huli people and it marks the transition of young boys into adulthood, men. This ceremony revolves around the practice of wig making and it's rooted in the cultural traditions of the Huli tribe. During this initiation, boys would undergo a series of rituals and teachings led by elders of the community. One of the big parts of this initiation is the crafting of traditional wigs made from human hair, animal fur, and natural materials such as feathers and plants. These wigs hold big significance and they're worn by the initiates as they undergo their tribes. The events usually include rigorous training in hunting, warfare, storytelling, and just all the skills needed to be an adult and they learn about their roles and responsibilities within the community through these rituals. It's just a passage into being an adult and a man. That's all it really is. Nothing brutal, nothing standoutish about this. With that being said, guys, that concludes the ancient ritual iceberg. This one was a doozy to get through and I'll be straight up. I don't really like the entry choices because a lot of them are really the same. Nothing stands out too crazy here except for some of the first entries ironically enough but that being said if you enjoyed the content if you enjoyed the video feel free to leave a like and subscribe and i hope to catch you all in the next one peace out